as a Christian, there's nothing that cripples us more than fear. Fear is that four-letter word that afflicts us from nine months old all the way up to 99 years old. As a Christian, fear can cripple us so much that it makes us hide. You think about Adam and Eve. When they had sinned, what did they do? For fear of God, they hid themselves. And yet God said, where are you? Not just where are you hiding, but where did you go, Adam and Eve, the one I created, the one whom I love so much? Why would you hide from me? For fear. For fear of what God was going to do to them now that they had disobeyed his commandments. And you all have heard that beautiful, glorious joke that Catholics are only in the church for fire insurance so you don't go to hell. But yet at the same time, fear cripples us. St. Teresa of Avila said, it's the chief activator of our faults. So particularly Father Andy's faults are usually triggered by fear. And fear is something that afflicts all of us. It's the real pandemic. Because fear is really not trusting in God and his power, his grace, the fact that he is in our favor, that he loves us even till the end. Because I lose sight of that, because the devil tempts me with these things of the world, the flesh and his own diabolical attacks, I fear. I fear of who's going to be president next time. I fear of what mom and dad are going to do when they find out what I did. I fear what's going to happen if I let go of my favorite toy. I fear putting down the game controller. I fear what happens if I get a flat tire. What happens if my car blows up? What happens? Dot, dot, dot. I fear. And this fear has hit the church in many ways. You could have a laundry list. I don't want to make this a 45-minute homily, but there's a lot of fear in all of us as Christians right now, in our own life, our particular circumstances, and fear about the future. And yet, you just heard in the gospel, for fear of the Jews, the disciples went to the upper room and locked the door. For fear of what happened to Jesus, what happened to them, they ran to the upper room. They hid themselves. But Jesus comes to them. He literally walks through the locked door, the obstacle in their life for fear, the obstacle that they themselves closed and locked. Jesus walks through, and his words are, peace be with you. Don't you wish Jesus would do that right now? Boy, I'd feel a lot better. You wouldn't have to listen to me in this homily. Just kidding, you have to. Point being, he breaks through the locked door. He breaks through the obstacles. He is the one who says, peace be with you. And he repairs the damage. Why are they fear fearful? Because sin has entered the world. Because what happened to Jesus may happen to us, and I don't like it, so I'm going to hide for fear. But he says, I'm going to remove not only the obstacle, the material door, the wooden door that you locked, I'm going to take away the sin of the world. I've done it. Of course, this gospel comes after his resurrection, so the job's been done. Why do you still fear, O men of little faith? You lock the doors, but I walk right through it and tell you whose sins you forgive, they are forgiven. I'm giving that authority to you as my disciples. The authority of Christ, the precious blood poured forth from the cross is now at your disposal. You will be the ones who forgive sins in my name, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But then, but then, Pentecost, Pentecost, right? Today's holy solemnity. They're in the same place. Doors closed. But the difference is they're waiting. They're not afraid. 
they're waiting. Why? Because Jesus said, if you pray for nine days this novena, I promise you, you're going to get the Holy Spirit. No, there was no novena. This was the first novena. This wasn't a magical prayer that will call down the Holy Spirit upon them. They were disposed. They were ready. They were dedicated to prayer and the breaking of the bread. Sound familiar? You pray. You also break bread. You receive the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. So you are disposed to receive the Holy Spirit. And on the ninth day, on the 50th day after his resurrection, the Holy Spirit comes as tongues of fire. That's when they're no longer fearful. That's when they become heroically courageous. That's when the doors cannot hold them back from going out to the world and taking the mandate of Jesus to the world. They literally speak all of the languages of the world at that time. That's why in the Acts of the Apostles, it lists them. Peds, they have the, the, the Mesopotamians, they have the Cretans, those who are from Greek. All of the, language of the uh, languages of the world, the people in Jerusalem heard them in their native tongue. What is this? Are these men drunk? Are they just babbling? No. This is the power of the Holy Spirit. This is what sets us free. This is what breaks through our fearfulness to give us the courage. Not just courage, because fortitude's a gift of the Holy Spirit too. But we have wisdom, knowledge, understanding, counsel, piety, fear of the Lord. You got six others besides courage. You participate in God's divine knowledge. You have an intuition that penetrates into the mysteries of life. You are able to pray, calling upon God as your father. As St. Paul says in Romans, we have the spirit of God who impels us to say, Abba, Father. That's piety. That's fortitude. That's wisdom. That's understanding. That's knowledge. That's counsel. You can talk to one another and mutually encourage one another. You don't have to stay in fear because of what Christ has done in us. St. Saint, um, Benedict, Pope Benedict XVI, he puts it this way. He says that the Holy Spirit overcomes fear. Here at Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit rested upon them, the disciples, those men emerged fearless and began to proclaim the good news of the crucified and risen Christ to all. Yes, wherever the Spirit of God enters, he puts fear to flight. He casts out fear, puts fear to flight. He makes us know and feel that we are in the hands of the omnipotence of love, the all-powerful God of love. And St. Paul goes even further. He says that the love of God, the Holy Spirit, has been poured into your heart to fill you up, to cast out that fear, to set you free. This is why St. Cyril of Alexandria said that with the Holy Spirit within us, it is quite natural for people who had been absorbed by the things of this world to become entirely otherworldly in their outlook and for cowards to become people of great courage. Cowards to become people of great courage. Men full of fear now become fearless. And this is particular to you because in our second reading, St. Paul from Corinthians tells us that the unique gift of the Holy Spirit is given to you, particularly because you have gifts and talents that not everybody in this church has. And so the Holy Spirit is going to activate those gifts in you for the glory of God and the salvation of your soul, that you are meant for a purpose to do something, do some things, many things for the glory of God. And St. Thomas Aquinas tells us that the Holy Spirit interiorly perfects our spirit. He communicates to us a dynamism, a new dynamism, so that it refrains from evil and chooses love. This is why St. Paul has the audacity to say in our second reading, Jesus is Lord. And nobody can say that except by the Holy Spirit. 
This is the true new dynamism that comes upon us when the Holy Spirit lives in us. We no longer are working for the flesh. We are no longer looking for money, power, respect, authority, sexual gratification, whatever it is, the works of the flesh are dead in us in whom the Spirit lives. This is why if you ever get discouraged, go to Romans 8. Go to the book of Romans chapter 8. This is life in the Spirit. This is the fulfillment of Jesus' promises to us. And this is where all of those familiar passages that come to mind come from. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on things of the flesh. Those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. If the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies, also through his spirit who dwells in you. For all who are led by the spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive a spirit of of slavery to fall back into fear. Oh, there's that word again. Not to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of sonship. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is the spirit himself bearing witness with our spirit, that we are children of God. Every time you pray the Our Father, the Holy Spirit is activated in you because you're calling upon your Father through whom the Holy Spirit comes to us. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with sighs too deep for words. We know that everything God works in everything. God works for the good of those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. What shall we say then? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, will he not also give all things to us in him? Who shall separate us from the love of God? Tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, or the sword? No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. I'm jumping around. I'm throwing scripture verses at you all from Romans 8. Can you imagine what I just skipped? How much it encourages you in times of need, times of peril, times of darkness, times of confusion, times of conflict. This is why the Holy Scriptures are our bedrock. They're the foundation for our belief, the non-negotiable, if you will, because the tradition of the church flows from Scripture. The magisterium is only holding us fast to Scripture and to tradition. That three-legged stool, Scripture, the words of God, literally the word of God, Jesus Christ. That's our grounding rod. That's what keeps us living in the spirit of God. And so in Romans chapter 12, St. Paul goes again and says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that you may know what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. This is why Jesus said to us and promised us I will pray the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever, the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. He goes on a couple of verses later, and he says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives, as Uh, Not as the world gives, do I give it to you. Let not your hearts be troubled. Let them not be afraid. Let them not be full of fear. So how do I do this? Father Andy, great. Scripture verses, I could look those up. Thanks. Big deal. Thanks. How do you do this? How do I stop being fearful? How do I stop sleeping when the world is going by me at breakneck speed? Well, it starts in our thoughts. It starts in our thoughts. 
It starts here. Because we have so many misbeliefs and lies that we carry around with us that it makes us have the audacity, the fearful audacity, not good audacity, fearful audacity to say, I'm no good. I can't do anything. I'm pathetic. Look at my life. You're despicable. God could never forgive you. All of these misbeliefs, these lies from the father of lies, the accuser himself, Satan, attack us in one way or another. But we need to be able to discern. We need to be able to see what is of the Spirit and what is not of the Spirit. Because what's not of the Spirit, you need to immediately, by the authority of Christ, who lives in you and in the name of Jesus Christ, rebuke, reject, and renounce those lies whenever they come up whether it's at work, with your family, as a husband, as a wife, as a father of mercy, as a religious, as a novice, whatever it is, whenever these lies come up, reject, rebuke, and renounce them immediately. And there's a great prayer card that helps us to uh, discern this. It's put out by the St. Michael Center for Spiritual Renewal. And I just want to share it with you because it's based on the fruits of the Spirit. What are the fruits of the Spirit? Of course, you know these from Corinthians. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, generosity, gentleness, faithfulness, modesty, self-control, and chastity. You want that list? Galatians 5. It's that simple. But yet, what happens is that the bad fruits of Satan get sown in our life. And those are the opposite of what I just listed. The bad fruits of Satan, hatred, misery, discord, impatience, harshness, wickedness, greediness, violence, unreliability, immodesty, indulgence, and lust. Galatians tells us these things. This is how we discern. This is how we know, am I thinking as God does? Am I thinking according to the spirit of God or am I thinking according to the spirit of the world or flesh or the devil? Whatever the temptation, we recognize that St. Paul lists these. Whose voice am I listening to? If it's God's voice, then the fruits of my life are going to be patience, kindness, gentleness, boast, not boastfulness, <laughs> I'm sorry, not boastfulness, not rude, does not seek its own interests, does not keep account of wrongs, does not rejoice over unrighteousness, that only rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, perseveres through all things, and never fails. If that's the life you want to live, we listen to the Spirit. We seek out those things. Love is patient, love is kind, love is not jealous, love is not boastful, love is not rude. It does not seek its own interests, it does not keep account of wrongs, it does not rejoice over unrighteousness, it rejoices always in the truth, it bears all things, it believes all things, it hopes all things, it perseveres through all things, and it never fails. That's what's been poured into your heart. But what the world pours into you is the, is the opposite. What does Satan hate you? How, what does Satan's hate do in you? It makes me impatient. It makes me harsh and unkind. It makes me jealous. It makes me boastful. It makes me rude. It makes me seek my own interests. It makes me keep account of all the wrongs in my life. It rejoices in sin, my own and other people's sins. It makes me rejoice in falsehood. It makes me suffer nothing. It makes me doubt everything. It makes me despair of everything. It makes me quit everything, and it always loses. I know it's a lot to take in, but this is what's happening in your life. This is what's happening in your day-to-day -day life, in your marriage, in your family, in your friends, in your workplace, in this community. We must listen to the Holy Spirit. We must listen to that love of God poured forth into our hearts. We must look and seek out these things. 
these beautiful virtues and beautiful fruits of the Holy Spirit in our life. Because that's the promise of Jesus. That's the abundant life that he has in store for you. And you specifically in your life are entrusted with the Holy Spirit so that the particular love of God can come through you and touch those people in your sphere of influence. The Holy Spirit can work through us, through our co cooperation, through our disposition, dispo being disposed to the Lord and his love. So just listen again. Listen again as you receive Jesus today. Listen again to what is in store for you when God's love is in your heart. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not jealous or boastful. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It's not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongs, but rejoices in the right. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. This is the gift of God poured forth into your heart today as we celebrate Pentecost and as we receive Jesus who told us and promised us that these things he has spoken to us so that we will not be fearful anymore that we will truly have peace and we will live that abundant life